Hello again, it's Amit Power and welcome to part two of this lecture series on tips and tricks to maintain perineural catheters and avoid complications. In the first part of the video, we covered go what goals we have for perineural catheters, we talked about some of the complications and we talked about the differing catheter types. And for the second part, I'm going to cover guidance techniques and then focus on Twitter tips and tricks. And um, so what we concluded was despite the multiple options of casters that are out there, there was no superiority of one caster over another, depended really on personal and institutional preference, the anatomical location and the ease of use or skill of the practitioner. So now moving on to guidance techniques. Broadly speaking, you've got the options of peripheral nerve stimulated guided casters or ultrasound guided casters. And ultrasound, as I've re uh, referred to in part one, has largely replaced peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, some people are using dual guidance, peripheral nerve stimulation plus ultrasound, but there's not really any evidence of any clear benefit. But you could use peripheral nerve stimulation, if you would, for a single shot block. And you could use that to exclude intraneural placement or for deeply and poorly visible structures. So peripheral nerve stimulation via the needle to identify the target still has a role. So that's relatively straightforward. But when you're using ultrasound, what approach do you use? Now you may be thinking, what is he talking about? Well, I'll hopefully shed some light onto it. One of the first papers I referred to on my 50-50 here was this paper by Brian Ilfield, Michael Fredrickson and Ed Mariano. And they talked about three different approaches for using ultrasound uh, to sight catheters. And I'm going to explain them in a little bit more detail. So the first option kind of makes sense. is what we do most of the time. It's a short axis view of the nerve and a needle in plane. And you'll insert your needle in plane and you'll see it like this. You see the full shaft and the needle tip coming into view right next to this short sectional, cross-sectional view of the nerve. That's option one. Option two is you still take a cross-sectional view of the nerve and you needle out of plane. Of course, when you needle out of plane, you don't see the whole shaft or tip of the needle. You just see a cross-section of the needle and you have to be careful that you're scanning over the needle tip and not over the shaft. But that's a short axis nerve view and needle out of plane. And the third option is a long axis nerve view and needling in plane. So this is, you can start off with a cross-sectional view of a nerve, then rotate the probe through 90 degrees, so you're scanning it in long axis, and then you needle in plane, right onto the nerve. Sounds a bit tricky, right? Well, it is actually. Um, and when you're talking about long axis in plane, it takes time and it isn't easy. And a quote from the paper says, the problem is in the execution, because you've got to keep three structures, the needle, the nerve, and the caster, all in a line and it's uh, difficult to learn but also difficult to execute even after mastery so perhaps this is not what we should be focusing on there have been a couple of trials here comparing long and short axis imaging for in-plane ultrasound guided perineural catheter insertion uh, and this the lower one was for popliteal sciatic uh, and what did they conclude? In both of these studies they concluded that the long axis in-plane took longer to perform and offered no clear advantages. Uh, here's an example of a long axis in plane femoral catheter being cited. This video has come courtesy of uh, Professor Ki Jin Chin. You can see you've got part of a view of the long axis of the femoral nerve and the catheter coming in. It's difficult to keep the nerve and the catheter and the needle in view all at the same time. So what about the short axis technique? So again, you've got the short axis or cross-sectional view of the nerve and you can needle in plane versus out of plane. Well, short axis in plane kind of makes the most sense to me, but needle placement isn't the end point because when you've got your needle in place, you've then got to place the caster there. Where does the caster end up going? And often the caster will exit past the nerve. So here's an example of a short axis in plane approach to the popliteal sciatic nerve. You can see the two components, the common fibula, common perineal, and the tibial nerve separating out with that bolus of either saline or dextrose or of local anesthetic solution. So that's great. And now the catheter is going to be seen emerging from the needle. So there's the catheter that's gone in. And then let's see if we can find the needle has been removed. Where is the catheter? There's part of the catheter there, but where is the catheter tip? Well, actually, it's exited outside the sheath. And that's one of the problems. So short axis 
out of plane is a familiar technique because you know some people are used to using this for peripheral nerve stimulator guided blocks or even for putting in central lines and it probably is the most logical because you insert your needle uh, in in an outer plane technique and when you thread the catheter in theory the catheter will lie longer to the or close to the nerve for a longer period of time you can see an example of a catheter coming in plane between a, um, a popliteal sciatic nerve block here the issue, however, is when you thread the caster out of plane, it's not easy to identify where the needle tip has gone, but also where the catheter tip has gone. So this is a nice study uh, that was performed by Benson and colleagues, and they looked at popliteal sciatic nerve casters after major foot and ankle surgery, and had a look to see whether one particular approach was associated with dislodgement more than another. It took 40 patients having foot and ankle surgery. In 20 of the patients, they did a short axis in plane technique, and in 20 patients, they did a short axis outer plane technique. And 48 hours later, they took the patients to the MRI scanner, injected contrast, and had a look to see what had happened to the catheters. Well, here we go, we'll have a look. So the top image is short of ax short axis uh, out of plane. You can see a nice crotch sectional view of the nerves. The catheter tip just denoted by the green arrow there. Uh, and in the area below, is, or the image below, that short axis in plane, you can see the catheter coming in and literally the catheter being placed within that common paraneural sheath. So that's great. What happened when they scanned them in the MRI scan 48 hours later? So in these images, you can see uh, the MRI on the left is the short axis out of plane and the MRI on the right is the short axis in-plane catheter insertion, or example of those. The yellow circle delineates the sciatic nerve and where you would hope that the contrast would have stayed. However, the short axis out of plane, it seems to have stayed in the right place. The short axis in-plane, look where all of the contrast has gone in this particular example. Uh, it's leaked out and it's not now staying where it needs to be around the sciatic nerve. And if you look at their data, you can see the frequency of displacement was much higher in the short axis in-plane group than the short axis out-of-plane group. And they knew that actually um, when they sighted the, cath the, first, the catheters in the first place, all of them had gone in the right place, but clearly there was a, a higher degree of displacement in the short axis in-plane technique associated with a higher requirement for oral morphine. Why might this happen? Well, actually, if you do a short axis in-plane technique and you thread your catheter and place it nicely within the paraneural space or paraneural sheath, when muscle contracts, you can imagine that muscle movement is pulling the catheter out of where it should be, irrespective of how you fixed it on the skin. And that's probably the biggest issue. If you thread just enough catheter to be in the space, when the muscle contracts, it pulls the catheter out of the space. And that may be a reason. So is short axis out of plane best for other sites? What about short axis in plane versus short axis out of plane for interscaling? Well, here's a study looking at posterior versus an anterolateral approach for interscaling catheter placement, again by Friedrichsen. They took 110 patients, all by a single operator, and they compared interscaling brachial plexus catheter sighted via short axis outer plane versus in plane, and in all cases, the catheter was placed two centimeters beyond the needle tip. What they found from this study was short axis outer plane was easier to perform, quicker to perform, and more effective. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because the needle is flowing, um, or rather the needle is passing the catheter along the line of where the nerves are laying. So why was short axis in plane worse? Well, imagine what might happen here. You've got a cross-sectional view of your brachial plexus and you do your in plane needling tip it's possible that you might have traversed the plexus or that the catheter gets kinked. Whereas if you're gonna do it out of plane, you can see how you will find and thread your needle along the passage of the nerves that are lying in the brachial plexus. So it seems certainly for, for, for a lot of techniques, short axis out of plane seems to be the better technique. But there is more to it than this. Those are not the only options. You can do a short axis oblique out of plane technique. So here you go, you'd still take a short axis view of the nerve, but you bring your needle out of plane in an oblique fashion. Or you could do a short axis oblique in plane. So again, in theory, you get uh, when you pass your needle in place, you can thread more of your catheter along the nerve as opposed to traversing past it. So the other option is you could do a hybrid technique. 
So start short axis out of plane, get your needle close to the nerve, and then rotate your probe through 90 degrees, get a long axis view of the nerve, and then thread your catheter along the nerve. And I've tried that, and that seems to work quite well. I also want to talk about a pro tip from Kijin Chin. And here Kijin is talking about the issue we've talked about where movement in the subcutaneous tissue and muscle can cause catheters to migrate. So one of the ways he's dealt with, uh, with this is you, you place your needle, you get it in the right place, you thread your catheter, and as you're bringing your needle back, so you bring your needle back a bit, and then you thread a bit more catheter so it coils within the subcutaneous tissue, and then you move your needle completely. And what they've done, that internal coil within the tissue means that movement of the skin in the subcutaneous tissue or the muscle won't, won't cause catheter, catheter tip movement. So creating a bit of slack in the system may allow your catheter tip to stay where you want it to for longer. What about injectate fluid? Now, should we inject fluid before passing a catheter? Well, there's a couple of different arguments. Some people say there's no need uh, to place any fluid in the area before citing a catheter, and that's certainly relevant when you're using a stimulating catheter. Other people say, yes, you should inject fluid before you place a catheter to open up the space. And um, I think for me, it makes sense to inject some fluid via the needle to make the catheter insertion easier. There's probably no harm in doing that. Uh, and certainly I find that process makes more sense. You've opened up the space. There's now an area where the catheter can sit a bit better. The question is, should you inject your local anesthetic via the needle or via the catheter? Um, and there's a couple of people that, you know, a couple of studies that have looked at this. Um, many people say it makes no difference for onset or success. But personally, I like to inject low clans via the catheter alone because I want to know that when the patient is comfortable post my procedure, they're comfortable because the catheters are in the right place not because I performed a single shot block and opened up the space with local anesthetic and I've got no idea where my catheter tip is, is, is lying. I know some people do a hybrid, I know Ki Jin Chin injects some local anesthetic via the needle, then threads the catheter and injects the rest via the catheter. But for me, certainly when I haven't got a massive catheter practice, I want to make sure I know the catheter is working and the only way I can know that for sure is only via injecting local anesthetic via the catheter. Okay, so once we've uh, we've done all of that, how far should we be threading our catheter past the needle tip? Well, the answer is it needs to be far enough so you're close to the nerve, but not too far so you don't get knots or kinks. So probably the answer is more than one centimeter, but less than five centimeters. And if you want to look, uh, see what it looks like to see a caster curling as you're citing it here, another video by Ki Jin Chin is threading the caster. You can see the caster's curling in the tissue here. Um, so if you thread too much catheter, this is what can happen. But some people use this technique intentionally to get to curl and stay in a particular area. But this is certainly not an easy technique. So once you've placed your catheter, how can you find out where the tip of it lies? Well, there's a few options. Um, you can directly try to view the catheter tip via ultrasound. That can be difficult. You can try a little bit of movement of the catheter and see where the tissue is moving. Um, you can inject micro bubbles of air and use color doppler to visualize it and you can just inject air itself or just inject fluid so let's see what that looks like so here's me trying to move the catheter tip and see if i can identify where the catheter tip is and actually in this indication you can see the catheter tip has actually emerged outside the paraneural sheath so that would require the catheter to be moved back Here's an example of what it looks like if you inject micro bubbles and put color doppler on, you see that sort of spatter effect and so you know where the air is being injected at the tip of the catheter. This is what it's like if you inject fluid via the catheter and you're watching for that space to be expanded. That's one way of identifying where the catheter tip lies. Um, and this is again another example here. So you're looking for where the catheter uh, uh, expansion is occurring due to injectate via the catheter. So now we've done all of that how should we run our infusion so we've got a few options here and ultimately you want to get analgesia but minimal motor block so i tend to use dilute 0.1 percent bupivacaine or 0.125 percent bupivacaine but you might choose to use levobupivacaine or ropivacaine whatever your institution has as a preference and you could use a, a rate between 4 to 12 mils per hour depending upon the, the weight and the um, the amount of local anesthetic already being administered but it could depend upon where the catheter is whether it's interscaling you might need less volume than if it's ephemeral or certainly a fascial plane block and actually bolus versus continuous versus both so 
we are starting to appreciate now that fascial plane blocks require intermittent boluses as opposed to continuous infusions to get that working but more and more people are using intermittent boluses in the area of interscaling for example so they might use a bolus of of you know six to eight cc's of local anesthetic every four hours and they find they use far less local anesthetic than if they were to run a continuous infusion the evidence is still developing the whole time and we're still getting more so we're going to finish up now by talking about some Twitter tips and tricks. So I asked the people at Twitter, give me some tips, give me, give me some tricks, tell me what you do to make your catheters work. And by far the most important thing that came up from a lot of people is talking about tunneling the catheters to prevent dislocation. Now this study here was a porcine model and they looked at how much force was required to dislodge a catheter and clearly Tunneling a catheter meant that a much greater force was required to dislodge the catheter. Yes, this is in the porcine model, but it gives you an example, gives you an idea. Um, but it's also possible that tunneling might reduce the risk of infection. And this was an example of tunneling with thoracic epidural catheters. And I know many people are tunneling the catheters if they want them to stay in for a significant amount of time. And you can see how low the risk of infection is. There are a number of different ways for how you might tunnel. Um, this is one particular technique, and I know other people would tunnel, leaving their needle still in situ to protect the catheter. But this is one example where you can use the, the block needle that you use to put the catheter in to help you with tunneling. So my catheter is emerged now as a popliteal sciatic, um, and then I'm going to make a little nick right next to the catheter, and then take the needle and tunnel it uh, right next to the catheter. I protect the catheter and then I pass the needle in a retrograde manner back up through the shaft of the needle and then pull it out and just waiting to see it disappear. You can see that little loop and it'll pop underneath the skin and when it disappears you can cover that with a bit of dermabond. Um, so that's how I tend to do that. Um, people have also talked about the importance of using adhesives and glue. So um, what am I talking about? I'm talking about using Dermabond or Mastisol and certainly these adhesives are waterproof and they can significantly reduce the amount of leakage especially when you're using it for catheter through needle technique. So it's something to consider. So a lot of people have talked about using Dermabond to seal that hole uh, uh, and to minimise the risk of any leakage of, lo uh, of local anesthetic out through the way and other people are using mastosol to help the um, to help the dressing stick in place now this is a, a study by david ayong and what he did was he did 66 interscaling catheters and he compared um, dermabond versus mastosol so 32 had dermabond patients and 32 had mastosol um, and then they wanted to look at 48 hours later how many of those catheters were still close to the nerves and actually in that particular study the results were strongly in favour of Dermabond there was a minimal catheter migration and minimal leakage when you look at the, uh, the Massasol group there was uh, a degree of migration that occurred so Dermabond has a role in minimising catheter tip uh, migration so what do most people of Twitter do? So most people seem to use Dermabond to the skin exit site and then put Mastosol around that and then use Stereostrips and then a dressing. And I got one of my colleagues, John Edwards uh, and Stace Dollar to show me a video of what they do. So here we go, let's have a look at this. So there you go, there's the exit site with some Dermabond around it. There's an interscaling caster. Uh, and then having done that, they're then gonna apply some Mastosol around that exit site. Uh, and then having applied that master salt, they're going to make sure they dry it so it's nice and tacky. And then they're going to secure the cast in a particular location here and then use stereo strips to secure that in place on top of the master salt, which is also a bit more adhesive, an extra redundant coil in that. And then there's a chlorhexidine impregnated dressing that goes on top of all of that. And then another sticky label and then another tegado on top of all of that. That cast is not going to go anywhere. But the next step, they then put a coil on the caster where it meets the connector over here to make sure that stays nice and firm. And that way, that caster is going to stay nice and solid. So are there any other tips for skin fixation? Well, people talked about a whole host of different dressings, uh, locket devices, these other devices, the IV dressings. There's a whole host of different dressings that people use. But certainly one that's been very popular is the, is the chlorhexidine impregnated tegaderm. Uh, and this is a patient. This is somebody who said, I was on the receiving end recently, Dermabond to the insertion site, then a perifix dressing in the tegaderm. It was totally dry until the removal at day four. 
um, and they use hyperfix or like a me fix dressing to secure it up the leg and padded it. So that's a great uh, that's a great sign that's somebody who's an anaesthetist who's actually had a caster and it worked really well. So does it matter what we use? Well, I think most people say be sensible. Clean and dry the skin thoroughly. Use skin glue to prevent leakage at the exit site. We've talked about that. Then mask the sole or tink bends under the dressing if you can to, uh, to allow the dressing to stick. But it's important you allow that to dry before you apply the dressing. Um, there's possibly value in using steri strips and a coil of caster. But use small, well-applied dressings and make sure the edges of the dressings are stuck down. And consider where the surgeon is going to place the tourniquet because if they're going to place the tourniquet there you want your catheter way out of the way and beware of surgical drapes because you don't want that catheter you spent ages putting in to get pulled out so there are a couple of different things that we can do when we're thinking about maximizing the anchoring of the catheter uh, this is one study compared uh, two continuous catheter dressings uh, that are pictured here um, and the other things that people do here so this is James French who sandwiched a cast and connector in a dressing to minimize disconnection um, this is a, another colleague of ours who basically put a sacrificial dressing on top of the caster so if the drapes accidentally got stuck on the dressing when you pulled the drapes off only the sacrificial dressing went and actually James French again says he put some ultrasound lube over the dressing so that the surgical drapes don't stick to the dressing that's a great idea thank you James for that so what are my summary of the tips well Colin McCartney says it, Colin McCartney says it very well three D's do lots of casters use Dermabond and use sensible dressings so how am I going to summarise? Well, we need to select our patients carefully and have pathways for monitoring and for follow-up. Use ultrasound to cite your catheter so you make sure you're citing the catheter tip in the correct place. Use a sterile technique. Start with the ultrasound technique that you use for single shot blocks and most of the time that's going to be short access in plane or out of plane depending on what your preference is. Familiarise yourself with the catheters that are available and I think it makes sense to use a non-active fluid to open up that pocket for your catheter to be inserted but certainly thread no more than 5 centimetres of catheter into the space. And if the catheter is going to be in for a while consider tunnelling it and I think it makes sense to deliver your local anaesthetic via your catheter and use a dilute solution of local anaesthetic in your infusion. If cost allows, use Dermabond or a skin glue at the exit site, but be meticulous with your dressing overall, and you want to make sure you don't allow the surgeons to pull it out. There's no point in doing any of this unless you follow your patients up to find out how they're doing. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I've got lots of thank yous. All of these people mentioned here are people that help contribute to ideas and concepts for this lecture. I'm very grateful to all of them. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you found this useful.